Okay, so we're gonna go into a little bit of um, technical coolness about Lower Tantra because I think people underestimate how powerful Lower Tantra can be. And some of the practices to do with Lower Tantra are really profound and really powerful. So I'm just gonna do a quick review of the four classes of Tantra just so that you're oriented. And then we're gonna do a bit of a deep dive into the Lower Tantra practices. So um, I'll have the PowerPoint up, but um, if you have questions, I'll make sure to leave some time. So this is from uh, Dr. Burzen, and I'm sure a lot of you know about the Study Buddhism website. It's an amazing resource. Um, he says, why Tantra is more efficient than Sutra. In a grand presentation of the stages of hidden mantra, Sonkapa examines three levels of Tantra. General Tantra, common to all four Tantra classes, Unatara Yoga Tantra, and Kala Chakra Tantra. In terms of each, there are four main reasons for Tantra being quicker and more effective method of practice for attaining enlightenment. One, the obtaining causes for attaining the enlightening body and mind of a Buddha are more analogous to the results we wish to attain. Two, there is a closer union of method and discriminating awareness as the path. Three, through voidness meditation on the appearance of our body as that of a Buddha figure, there is a special basis for understanding of voidness that is more subtle, more stable, and less deceptive than our ordinary body as the basis. And four, there is a special level of mental activity, the clear light mind used for perceiving voidness. So highest yoga tantra is kept particularly secret to prevent wrong views and confusion. So just the quick highest yoga tantra subdivision is generation stage and completion stage. And generation stage practice, there is actually practices that you may be familiar with before you even met Tantra, which are the meditation on the eight stages at the time of death. So this is kind of part one of three in a classic generation stage meditation. And getting familiar with the eight stages at the time of death is incredibly important for all levels of practitioner. But know that when you do do highest yoga Tantra, that meditation will come in handy and there's more to be done with it. So it's a very powerful thing to get familiar with. The completion stage is where there is more actual manipulation of the channels, winds and drops within the body. And you need the very strong basis of having done the generation stage practices first. So highest yoga tantra, we're not gonna talk about very much this weekend. Um, we, we can talk about some general things occasionally as you have questions, but I guess the important thing to realize about the secrecy is that it's not because there's something shameful or something embarrassing about Tantra. It's because of how easily there are wrong views and confusion. Okay, so I think that that is a huge misunderstanding in Tantra and you'll see, you know, Tantric deities in union or looking angry or halos of fire or snarly teeth or like it's really full on imagery. But I think what people need to understand is that we keep those images somewhat private in the past because seeing them is confusing. The problem is now they're everywhere. And sometimes some Dharma centers even have very secret images just out in the public gampa and new people see them and they think, what, what? <laughs> and they're either too excited or too alarmed or they're misunderstanding. And you know, even before you get into Tantra that surely it's symbolic of something, surely. And yes, it is symbolic of any number of things. But what we're really talking about is the display of negative states of mind is not the same thing as a negative state of mind. The essence of the philosophy of Tantra, um, as is quoted in one of the most famous texts is it's like, a termite born from wood, eating the wood. So you have attachment, you realize that it's empty and that destroys attachment, yeah? But you need to have attachment first at various levels like attachment to cake. So you let the attachment to cake arise, 
you realize that it's empty of inherent existence and that destroys the very attachment that you started with. So when you see these images, it's reminding you of the very things we're trying to overcome and the catalysts for the very things that we're trying to overcome. But it's also saying that everything that is the scariest or the most kind of like rage filled, lust filled, confusion filled aspects of your experience are workable. Yeah, that actually all of that energy doesn't need to be lost or suppressed or subdued. It just needs a transformation. So the energy that accompanies attachment or the energy that accompanies hatred can be used for compassion, loving kindness, and the wisdom realizing emptiness most deeply. So when you see these images, you already probably knew that a little bit or knew that quite well. New people, we keep it secret from them because unless they get a whole conversation in context, they're going to be weirded out. Yeah, so it's not private because we're ashamed, it's private because it needs a lot of conversation. And when you have your sadhanas and things and your tantric implements and things, keeping them separate and secret is a way of kind of preserving the sacredness and the energy of them. You know, if your friend comes over and touches your tantric implements, it's not the end of the world, don't get weird and superstitious, but also don't have them out as a display, like, look at me, I'm a fancy tantric practitioner. You know, it's, it's really using your common sense of what you know to be true about keeping things quiet and sacred. Yeah, and you're preserving the energy and the continuity and the momentum by giving things respect in this way, while at the same time remembering they're empty. So it's just that gentle pivot back and forth between it arises from emptiness and it has this form, this form is important and sacred, but it's empty. Yeah, and it arises from emptiness, it's an important, it's, it's sacred, we preserve it, but it's empty, you know? So you're not becoming a fundamentalist, but you're also not becoming flippant. Yeah. So highest yoga tantra, that's the brief aside. Going into the lower tantras, um, the three lower tantras are Kriya Tantra, Action Tantra, for example, Chenrezig, Charya Tantra or Performance Tantra, example, Vajrapani, although there's Vajrapani forms in all classes, and Yoga Tantra or Union Tantra, for example, Kunrig. Okay, so the three lower tantras all have this, these two main meditations, but they're not explicitly listed in the practice manuals. This is some of the behind the scenes scaffolding that's built into the lower tantras that are very profound. So we have yoga with sign and yoga without sign. So yoga in Buddhist tantra refers to the spiritual discipline to which one yokes oneself in order to achieve full integration of body and mind. Sign in Buddhist Tantra refers to our innate grasping at the appearances, projections, and signs of inherent existence. So sign means to still have a sense of ourselves as truly existing. When we meditate on the deity, because we only have a conceptual understanding of emptiness, all the aspects of the practice are still seen as existing intrinsically. This is yoga with sign. Yoga without sign is thus the practice where that grasping at true existence has been overcome. So basically you're, you're working with deity yoga while you understand emptiness but haven't realized it. And then it upgrades once you've realized emptiness. Okay, so going back to the four classes, Kriya Tantra or Action Tantra. Here, the focus of Kriya Tantra is outer practices such as cleanliness, dietary mandates, use of mudras, you know, these hand gestures. And these practices support health and long life. With health and long life, hopefully one has time to develop deep realizations. So some people even say you practice lower Tantra to buy yourself time to have more time to practice higher Tantra. But you're not, the main thing is that you're not thinking you want health and long life for their own sake. 
you're thinking the reason I want health and long life is because I have a perfect human rebirth and it's the best foundation to practice. So, you know, I need this life to go as long as it can so I can get a great deal of work done on the spiritual path. Because even if we die and are reborn as a human being again in a perfect condition, it'll take a while to grow up, to relearn some things, to kind of get back in the saddle with our practice. So we want to stretch this life as long as we can while still staying healthy and vibrant so that we can practice. So that's one of the main benefits of Kriya Tantra is that it supports health and long life. And noteworthy, and I'm sure you all know this, is that all deities of all classes of Tantra have many aspects. Like you have Forearm Chenrezig and you have Thousand Arm Chenrezig. Both are still just Kriya Tantra. And then of course you have Galwagatso and you have Mahakala and you have Hayagriva and all of these are related to Chenrezig as well in the higher Tantras. So performance Tantra or Charya Tantra, the focus is also mainly on outer practices particularly ritual and use of mudras, as well as many recitations. So this is rarely practiced in our tradition, and Charya Tantra is very similar to Kriya Tantra. <coughs> Excuse me. So you might have seen Vajrapani like at the bottom of a tanka, and these protectors, which are sometimes worldly deities, sometimes actual Buddhas, they can be in wrathful aspect or like scary aspect, but the, the aspect of wrath is to intimidate the disturbing emotions of those making inner or outer obstacles. It's not to intimidate the being or hurt the being, it's to intimidate their negative states of mind. So anytime you're seeing these wrathful deities, whether they're at the bottom of tankas or they're like peripheral to your practice, or they're the practice you're doing, keep remembering that that aspect of rage and scariness is completely free from ill will. And I'm sure that you would guess that anyway, but it's not like somehow you have elevated righteous anger. No, you don't have anger at all. You have the appearance of anger, which intimidates other people's anger, but not them. It's a little bit like if you've seen a really skillful uh, dog trainer with a really, really scary dog. Sometimes the dog trainer adopts a certain kind of like powerful aspect um, and immediately the dog just kind of sits down and is quiet and is like, oh, you're in charge? Oh, okay. I'm happy with that. Have you seen that? As opposed to like a really scary dog, dog trainer who might like beat the dog into submission. That's not what we're doing. But still, it's a positioning of strength, which subdues the negative state of mind. But it should have that same feeling as a very skillful dog trainer with a scary dog. The scary dog being like the afflictions of some other person, right? Where when that skillful trainer does a powerful stance of some kind, and that dog subdues, they're actually happy. Yeah, have you ever seen those documentaries? Like the dog's even kind of wagging his tail before he was snarling and growling and wanted to bite him. And then the trainer has gotten his anger to subdue and he's actually happy to be subdued. So that's the way the protectors are and the wrathful deities are with the negative states of mind of sentient beings. It's not like um, a bully meeting a bully. It's someone with strong assertiveness meeting bully energy. So you have to stand up to bullies, don't you? But my, fighting fire with fire just creates a cycle of violence. So we have to be so clear about the distinction between wrath and anger, because they can look exactly the same, but feel totally different. Does that make sense? So you're going to see those guys all over the place, whether they're in your practice explicitly or not. Um, but it's good to know what the scary aspects mean. And then yoga tantra or union tantra, this one places a little bit more emphasis on it, internal activities than the first two. Um, the bardo rituals for those who have died, as well as practices to help those who have taken rebirth in the lower realms, these come from yoga tantras. So practices like kunrig also have numerous and elaborate hand mudras. Um, this is our, the main deity we practice in our tradition of yoga tantra, and he still is quite rare. This is Kunrig. 
Um, but sometimes when there's elaborate prayers for the dead, it's coming from this Tantra. And so all of these lower Tantras do practices related to subduing the vital winds. So the various winds circulate in the body, the upward moving wind, the downward voiding wind and so forth. And we say wind like energy, right? Not like air. And they keep the body functioning. So prana, the vital wind or life supporting wind is one of those basic winds. Pranayama in Kriya Tantra means to stop conceptual thought by holding the breath with a technique called vase breathing. This is a very profound and powerful technique, especially when combined with the visualization of our mind as a moon disc at our heart. So um, the preliminary to these techniques to become familiar with them are things like the nine round breathing. Okay, so breath work and Tantra go together, but if you're reading a Tantric Sadhana, you don't say, pause here to do breath work, pause here, pranayama, you know? And so you're kind of like, wait, no one ever told me I'm offended. It's annoying, right? All of this cool breath work stuff is not in the sadhana. It's all in the background scaffolding. And so it's one of these things where probably the first time you do it, you need someone to walk you through it in a group practice. Yeah. Or at least have a really, really excellent manual. I mean, Geshe Tashi Sering's book on Tantra explains it pretty well, but you might use it as a reference after you've seen it first. Yeah, and been walked through it first and then use that book as a reference. But the breath work that you do in the lower tantras prepares you for the breath work you do in the higher tantras. They're not exactly the same practice, but it's all kind of getting into control and getting into familiarity with these channels in the body and um, you know, all Asian systems explain the chakra system very similarly. But basically your central channel and your side channels are visualized as straight in three lines, even though the reality is that the side ones wrap around the central one in knots. And those are the chakras, right? And what the problem is, is that our mind rides on the wind and it gets, it can't actually enter into the central channel and it can't um, be manipulated as flexibly as we'd like it to be. And our body mind connection is all out of sorts at our level. And we even feel these chakras without knowing it. I think when you're particularly anxious, you get kind of a tightness in the chest or like a pit in your stomach. You know, that's, so those little knots around your central channel got even tighter than usual, and then they kind of loosen up a bit. So starting to kind of notice that they exist and starting to gently manipulate them can make it easier to do these practices when you start learning them. Why learn them? Well, the really cool thing about lower tantras is that it helps you develop calm abiding and special insight simultaneously. So in the sutra path, you're developing calm abiding, single pointed concentration on a virtuous object as its own project, right? You're using the breath or you're using a mental image or you're using the mind itself or you're using a concept, but it's just one thing. Yeah, you're focusing your mind on one thing and bringing it back and you get distracted and you bring it back and you get distracted and you bring it back. And that's one project of meditation. We might call it shamatha or shine, right? Calm abiding or serenity, the million um, different words for it, but single pointed concentration. And it's hard because our mind likes to multitask, but after a while, the mind starts to like being focused and there's kind of a flow state that can happen and that's lovely, but it's like one project. And then the other project is analytical meditation, which turns into like special insight into the nature of reality, using the wisdom realizing emptiness, but it also can be into things like how to practice compassion more effectively or how to practice patience, you know, all the analytical topics. So in those meditations, the mind is moving proactively, analyzing on purpose. It's still staying contained within a structure. It's not just going off on tangents or free associating, but there's movement in analytical meditation. 
And in Sutra, we're learning that you need the stability of single pointedness and the flexibility of analysis to eventually come together on emptiness for you to then realize emptiness directly. Yeah, you eventually bring them together, but you need them both very strongly on their own first. In Tantra, you're practicing them together from the beginning. And the way that you're doing that is you have the visualization of the body of the deity. You're doing the breath work, which actually helps you stabilize your concentration. And then you're remembering all of this is in the nature of bliss and emptiness. So you're having an analytical thought, a visualization, and a body situation happening. It's a lot. And at first you have to kind of build them, you know, work on one part, work on one part, work on one part. But you can bring them all together and start developing your calm abiding and special insight simultaneously from the very beginning of your path, or at least the beginning of your tantric path. So it's more efficient. And in some ways, it's more fun because your mind likes to multitask. So at first, you're just kind of getting used to what does the deity look like? What are my channels like? And you just keep it simple. Not all the gazillions of channels in your body, just three. Yeah, just the main three. And not a super elaborate deity. You're using a Kriya Tantra deity, which usually just has one face and two arms and two legs. Of course, as you get into the higher tantras, more faces, more legs, more hands, you can think of more channels, more branches of the channels, it gets more elaborate, but it's variations on the same theme. So it's actually less hard than it sounds once you get the basics. So the first basic that we learn, and sometimes you learn it divorced from context, is nine round breathing. It's one of those ones where, um, a lot of my teachers say, even if you're not even doing your sadhana yet, just to do it first thing in the morning really gets your, you clear and stable. It's very short um, and it's very simple, but it helps you come into connection with the fact of your channels and starts to get things moving more smoothly. So in the visualization, you imagine that your channels are not all locked around each other. You imagine that they're all nice and flowing and straight, even though that's not the case. It kind of invites it to be the case eventually. So we'll do a little um, experiment with it. And this will be familiar to some of you, but don't worry, I'll walk you through it if it's new. So a little meditation. And so just take a minute, calm the mind. Focus your attention on the breath. You can use the technique of counting the breaths to settle the mind and bring it to a state of deeper focus and concentration, ready to engage in meditation. But just spend a minute just with the breath, no big deal, letting yourself settle. And as the mind starts to settle, create an altruistic motivation for the session. Think that you are meditating, not just for your own individual benefit, but you're taking the time now to meditate and develop your mind to become a wiser and kinder person, able to be of benefit to all beings and connect with refuge in bodhicitta. So just gradually bring your motivation back to your mind. And now begin by visualizing the three psychic channels or tubes within your body through which the wind energy moves. The channels are round and hollow, 
the size of a straw and very fine, smooth, flexible and luminous. The central channel is blue. It starts at a point midway between the eyebrows, curves up and back along the inside of the skull, like the handle of an umbrella, and then down along the inside of the spine to a point four finger widths below the navel. The right channel is red and runs from the right nostril back and then downward along the right side of the central channel to end at a point four finger widths below the navel. The left channel is white, also runs from the left nostril down along the left side of the spine to also end four finger widths below the navel. For this meditation, imagine that the ends of the three channels join together at this point, four finger widths below the navel. And just focus for a moment on this visualization. And if you need to glance at the picture, go ahead. Just try and imagine these inside your own body. For the first three rounds, we're going to breathe in through our right and out through the left. So hold the left nostril closed with an index finger. Inhale slowly and fully through the right nostril. Imagine that you are sending the breath all the way down to the end of the right channel. Imagine that the breath flows from the right into the left channel as you move your index finger to hold the right nostril close. Now exhale slowly and fully through the left nostril. As the breath leaves the left nostril, Imagine that all the impurities, such as distraction and mental dullness, are expelled with the breath. So do this three times at your own speed. In through the right, out through the left. And breathing normally. The next rounds, you'll breathe in through your left and out through the right. So you reverse the process, holding the right nostril closed with your index finger. Breathe in deeply through the left nostril, sending the breath all the way down to the end of the left channel.
as the breath moves into the right channel, move your index finger to hold the left nostril closed. Exhale slowly and fully through the right nostril. As the breath leaves the right nostril, imagine that all impurities are expelled with the breath. Doing this three times at your own speed. In through the left, out through the right. And then for the last three rounds, you'll breathe in through both channels and then imagine the air going out through the center. So now inhale slowly and deeply through both nostrils, sending the air down through the right and left channels. As you exhale, imagine that the breath is expelled up and out through the central channel. As you breathe out, imagine that you are expelling all impurities out through the point between the two brows. And repeat two more times. Breathing in through both, out through the center. At your own speed. And then we dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious few of emptiness that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay. So some people like to do uh, nine rounds several times. Some people um, like to add in ideas about the afflictions being cleared from each. There's a lot of layers you can add, but just keeping it really simple um, is very effective, even without any particular analysis, just very gentle, spacious visualization, slow, intentional breaths. It can really help. Um, and it's a great preliminary to any meditation. But in terms of the lower tantras, it helps you get used to just very gently starting to control the breath in a way that's not uh, stressful, doesn't feel like too much pressure, but is just gradually kind of getting used to the relationship between the coarse outer breath and the subtle energy within the body. Um, do you, yeah, go ahead, Mika. Most of the time happens when I now, also now when I do the breathing, um, I start, I, I start coughing and emotions coming up. Mm. <clears throat> um, I've learned in my life to 
suppress, I think it's suppress the emotions and not let them out. And also when I, um, yeah, it's, and I find it for me now on Zoom, this is very safe because I can turn off the video and just start crying or something. But it feels, it feels like not okay. And it's, it's like, I'm still struggling about it. And, and I think it's the emotions when I can see the emotions on empty of an errant nature. Mm-hmm. And what you just said a couple of minutes or before this, then then I can can use it. But, but it's still like it's still yeah, it feels still wrong or that, that it's coming up. Uh, mm-hmm. if the the question now is if it comes up, do I have to go just do it again and again? Or and or when I start coughing up a coughing or something. Just let it go, or stop the stop the practice. That that's mm. that's, uh, that's my yeah. Opinion. No, I'm I'm glad you brought it up because it, it happens. Um, it can happen to any of us, and I think part of the the beauty of tantra is there's a lot more of an obvious relationship between body and mind that gets utilized. And we all know that emotions are mental, but also kind of get stored in the body as well, or trapped or blocked, or, you know, there's a physical aspect to our mental experience. And even though this body will die and decompose and our mind will cont- continue on, nevertheless, it's in this body now. Yeah. And so sometimes even just sitting still, not even doing nine round breathing, the emotions come up. Sometimes Mm -hmm. just a basic breathing meditation, emotions coming up. And the question to ask yourself is, how much space do I have today to process? Yeah. If you've got some space to process, just keep doing it gently without any kind of forcefulness until it feels like it rolls through. Because sometimes what happens is that the content of the emotion may have been relatively dealt with or not, you know, only, you know, but the energy of it's still stuck, you know, like I've dealt with that years ago. I I think about it a good way. I've reframed it. I've processed it, but your body does not agree. (laughs) Yes. And it's so frustrating because you're like, come on body, catch up, catch up to my mind. But sometimes it actually hasn't been kind of allowed to let everything digest all the things that have happened in our life, just to let it integrate and digest and roll through. So if you have space for it, to kind of watch the way emotions are like waves that can just roll through and at the apex, they're really uncomfortable and they're not what you want. But if you can kind of be steady with them, they'll naturally roll through and finish. If you keep blocking them each time, then they, they keep coming up to that crescendo each time. But if you can kind of let them all the way roll through, some of those big ones might actually release. But it's only if you've got space for it. I I think that with all meditation, it's your relationship to the distractions that are the key, not having them or not. Yeah, you're always going to have distractions. It's about looking at your relationship to them, or you're always going to have distractions, at least till you're enlightened. But, you know, so it's like today the distractions might be, I'm just kind of bored or I'm just kind of over it. Okay, what's your relationship to that? Then the next day, oh my gosh, all of this grief, all of this trauma, all of this, oh my gosh, what's your relationship to that? Then other days are, you know, all these sort of temptations and a song from the radio and all the things you want to do today. And you're all kind of happy, excited and buzzy. What's your relationship to that? And, you know, it's, it's creating the correct kind of distance. Because you don't want to push away your emotions, you don't want to suppress your emotions, but you also don't want to believe them. Yeah, they they kind of, they're here, they must be experienced, but that doesn't mean you believe in them. Yeah, like the classic in the Lam Rim, you know, the, the person walking down the footpath at twilight and they see the rope curled up and they think it's a snake. They can be just as scared of that rope as if it were an actual snake. It doesn't matter if it was true or not, the fear is the same. And this helps us remember the lack of inherent existence. But still, whether it was a snake or a rope, your nervous system is agitated. You know, whether it's true or not doesn't even really matter. Your body thinks it was. So let it roll through. 
Otherwise you just kind of keep re um, blocking the same things again and again. So changing your relationship to, to your emotions yeah, without kind of needing to agree with them or disagree with them. Yeah, not pushing or pulling with them, just kind of, huh, okay. Yeah. And being really kind to yourself the whole way through. Because it's those ones that we've been very present with the whole chapter of the emotion that we then have the space to be really present with other people with. If we haven't been present through the whole chapter of that emotion, when we see it in someone else, we get a little panicky and we want to fix it and we want to stop it for them and we want to be healthy. And, you know, we sort of suffocate their creativity to get through their own stuff because we're kind of panicked to be there with it. But if you've dealt with your stuff, then you're not putting it on other people. You're just able to hold the space. So it also helps with your compassion work if you can be compassionate with yourself when these things happen, because they will. Yeah. Yeah. And days you don't have space for it, you go, oh, there's a little nugget I'm going to come back to. Okay. Oh, money, pay my home. I got to go to work. We're coming back to this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I don't know. Does that, does that help? Does that resonate with your own wisdom? Yes, it resonates. It's, it's, like it's helpful now that somebody someone else tells it you can read about it in, in the text and so on but now it's, uh, um yeah it helps yeah. yeah you're not alone don't worry you're not alone but also that helps yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah it helps to be yeah and practical yes so thank you very much yeah and, and it's a good thing for us all to remember if we're in retreat too, is in a group retreat, is that different people are going to take turns popping off. And so <laughs> then we can kind of be a bit patient, a bit more flexible. You know, we're going to be the one that has a day someone else is going to be. And what can happen is when you're in a group, like what Mika was saying about how nice it is to turn off the Zoom so you don't get embarrassed. In retreat, you can't just turn off the Zoom. You know, they see you and then all of your pride is embarrassed to be seen. And then you get all kind of tight and kind of defensive and kind of reactive. And then there's drama. So prepare for drama in group retreats because people have stuff come up and then they're ashamed of it. And then they block it and then they get tight and then they get obnoxious and it's suffering but it happens, you know? So if we just didn't have pride, we could just work through all of our other emotions in public and not worry about it, but we get so embarrassed that then we add layers and layers on top of what's already happening. So anyway, group retreat is beautiful and fun, but if someone tells you that their group retreat was magical and peaceful and there was no drama whatsoever, I would say that is rare. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions about nine round breathing or um, any stuff that came up that you were curious about? Thank you. Um, well, you, uh, I've used white light when I've done the nine round, but I've never used the, the, the red, blue and white. Um, uh, what do you think about visualizing that? Visualizing the, the white, blue and red? I don't know. While well, I'm doing the nine round as well just keep it white keep it simple i think keep it simple some people add tonglen to this practice um mm -hmm. there is a tradition of adding tonglen to this practice so in in black out white yes but um that's kind of after you've already stabilized a bit the mm -hmm. channels are the three colors because mm -hmm. theoretically those are the three colors that they are mm -hmm. so so I wouldn't necessarily bring in like Om Ahum stuff right away. I would kind of close one chapter of the meditation and then shift to another chapter of the meditation consciously without kind of blurring it together too much. But, but right after, you know, after nine round breathing to do the Om Ahum meditation with the three colors might be really nice because you're in a really stable spot for it. It might really be quite profound. Oh, wow. Thank yeah. You. So if that's one you like, it'd be good to do back to back. Sweet, absolutely. I'm always doing home. <laughs> yeah. Thank so, you. um, so okay. So this idea of yoga with signs, yoga without signs. This is the lower tantra methodology that's built in, but isn't really talked about in the practice manual itself. And the terminology is a little off-putting because it's new, but just it's 
meditations before you've realized emptiness, meditations after you've realized emptiness. Okay, so before you've realized emptiness, there's more emphasis on visualization and breath work. After you've realized emptiness, the visualization is a little bit less important. So I'll, I'll kind of run you through it, but I think it's really interesting to know that it's built in because then you can ask for more teachings on it. Okay, so yoga with sign is the starting point of all lower tantra visualizations. So these deity yoga visualization practices offer a unique way of cultivating very sharp and deep concentration. Thus the three branches of yoga with sign are called the three concentrations. So of course we have to have a subdivision now. So we have the concentration of the four branch repetition, the concentration of abiding in fire and the concentration of abiding in sound. And some of these words might be familiar to you if you've ever done a nungne, because in the nungne sadhana, the prayers reference these and you might've wondered what they were referring to. So this first one, this four branches of repetition refer to different ways of reciting the mantra. So the mantra may take different forms, syllables at the deity's heart, syllables at our own heart, sound moving backward and forward, but its purpose is to develop strong, sharp concentration. So the four branch repetition, again, these words can be off-putting, but they're actually easier than they sound. So abiding on the basis of another, abiding on the basis of oneself, abiding on the basis of mind, abiding on the basis of sound, these are just your focal objects. Okay, so <clears throat> abiding on the basis of another is front generation and accumulates merit and inspiration. And then the other three are self-generated deities. So oneself, mind, and sound. This develops calm abiding and special insight. So when we say front generation and self-generation, are those familiar terms to you guys? Ish, yeah? Self-generation, yourself is the deity, front generation, the deity in front. Yeah. And the relationship between the front generation and the self-generation is, is kind of a fascinating thing to play with. The main thing at this point to be clear on is that you only do self-generation into practices you've had the specific empowerment for. Right. So if you've had a green ta Tara empowerment, you then it doesn't mean you can just suddenly do medicine Buddha practice unless you've done medicine Buddha empowerment as well. But you can do the practice seeing the medicine Buddha in front anywhere it says self. Does that make sense? So until you have permission, you can still do these practices, but you just don't identify as the deity until you've had the empowerment of that deity. Um, so I think that that's pretty clear, but it's one of those things that we have to keep coming back to because sometimes once people have had one empowerment, they think the door is open to all of them and you do need to have them one by one, even if they're quite related. Okay, so four branch repetition, abiding in the basis of another, um, the first part, front generation can describe many meditations but all are positioned in the space in front facing itself. So the main deity and mandala and the merit field. So when we're talking front generated deities, um, sometimes you can have them on the crown of your head in uh, the mantra part, but when they're in this section, we're talking about the, basically the ones that you're giving offerings to, um, it can be the main deity, like if you're practicing Chenrezig, it starts with Chenrezig in front, sometimes with a mandala, or it can be the whole merit field. And then abiding on the basis of oneself, mind, and sound. This is that six deities practice that, again, you probably have seen in the Nungne Sadhana. So this is just a process of self-generation. And every single tantric practice has layers to develop self-generation. This one, the six deities, is the one used in lower tantra. And it's really beautiful. And it's kind of like the way the universe of our practice gets created. 
So the deity of emptiness is just a meditation on emptiness. You meditate and you think myself, the deity, all phenomena are one taste in emptiness. And then from emptiness comes the deity of sound, just meaning the sound of the mantra begins to resound in space. And in this case, it would be Om Mani Peme Hum. But Om Mani Peme Hum wouldn't be each syllable distinctly. It'd be like resonating, like the sound of a singing bowl. So Om Mani Peme Hum, Mani Peme Hum, Mani Peme Hum, like so fast you can't hear each individual syllable. You just hear the sound of the mantra. And then the sound of the mantra takes shape and it takes the shape of the letters of the mantra or the syllables of the mantra. And it could be Tibetan, it could be Sanskrit, it could be English, it could be Mandarin, it can be whatever are letters that depict that sound most easily for you. And then that sound and letters mixing becomes the form of the deity. Yeah, the actual shape of Chenrezig, for example. And the deity of mudra, doing the gesture related to that deity, and then the deity of syllable is mainly stabilizing that and developing divine pride and clear appearance, it is then placing om, ah, and hum. So self-generation is something that happens again and again in every single sadhana. Sometimes it's in one moment you arise as the deity. Sometimes you arise as the deity very gradually over many, many steps. But what's happening here is destroying ordinary appearance and grasping. Yeah, ordinary appearance and grasping. What does it mean, team? Do you know? Yeah, what does it mean to destroy ordinary appearance and grasping? It would be having an understanding of emptiness in terms of um, everything you view, everything you think, everything you say. Yep, yep, yeah, exactly. It's, it's like the tantric realization of emptiness, isn't it? You know, so it's, it's the wisdom realizing emptiness that you're already cultivating, but what you're adding to that is getting rid of the grasping at yourself, not only as inherently existent, but as ordinary. So it's kind of like emptiness plus, and the plus is then you as the deity to help cut through your sense of ordinariness. And it's again that psychology I was talking about before of how we relate to other people as, you know, their body, their personality, their whatever, their whatever, and that's all very new and surface. That's also how we see ourselves. You know, we think of ourselves as our body, our history, our personality, our voice, our education, our financial status, whatever, you know, all these very surface things, plus just our innate grasping at the self. When you visualize yourself as the deity, you have to first dissolve everything into emptiness and then arise as the deity. And otherwise it's like your ordinary self is wearing a Chenrezig suit, you know, and you're kind of feeling like you're, I don't know, a pretender in this little costume, but you're really not the deity. So when you dissolve into emptiness, it means you're remembering the fact that it's all empty of inherent existence which opens back up that sense of infinite potentiality from which you arise as the Buddha you'll become. And that Buddha you'll become is way more you than the, this person you identify as. So the deity is also empty of inherent existence, but your Buddha nature, your mind being empty of inherent existence and its ability to develop has been with you from beginningless time. It cannot be destroyed. It can only be developed into Buddhahood. Your afflictions, your personality, your neuroses, your suffering, all of that is changing and the way you view it is changing and can be ended. So identifying as something that will eventually be destroyed is silly, but that's what we do, yeah? So you're just kind of like projecting the future into the present, which is actually realer than the present you sit with in this moment. It's more real. And that is a hard thing to kind of swallow. So overcoming ordinary appearance of yourself as ordinary and the grasping to it, this is the way you use the wisdom realizing emptiness in a tantric context. 
Yeah, it's, it's a deep practice, but it's something that is part of the reason why there's so many layers in self-generation, because we have so many layers of how we misidentify ourselves. So even just the sound of your voice, what you say, how you say it, where it comes from, doesn't all of that feel like I and me and inherent? And none of it is. You know, your, your vocal box and the way of speaking and which part of your vocal range you use and your way of using your face and your mouth and all of these things and your genetics and your culture and your language and all of that, quite new really. Even if you're old, it's quite new relative to beginningless time. You know, so all dissolved into emptiness and then the mantra. Beautiful, yeah? Much closer to you. So these self-generation practices, sometimes it feels like this is a long process to getting to where I know the sadhana is going, which is, I am Chenrezig, here is my mantra. Why all these steps? It's because we have a lot of layers of misengagement with the self that we need to break down. Just want to help Claire to ask her question or sitting in the chat about, um, she asked, how could you explain about tantric instrument like the like the fudge and bell, do you go out to buy? And yeah, how do you get it? Oh yeah, uh, you can just buy them at a shop. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> Sadly. Um, the thing with tantric implements is that if you have an empowerment, even a Kriya Tantra empowerment, you're allowed to use them. And it's good to use them. And strangely, lower tantras, it's more emphasized to use them than in higher tantras. Even though at Dharma centers, usually the reverse is the case. Usually it's the highest yoga practitioners that use their implements and the lower tantric practitioners don't even know how to use them. Um, technically, the lower tantras are more external. So doing displays and using the mudras is actually very helpful and um, a part of the practice. So it is good to learn them. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know, if you're taking a child to a fancy restaurant, you give them a lot of activities to keep them busy so that they don't cause chaos and break all the nice china. You're sort of giving yourself implements to keep your hands active with something positive, it gives your mind a little bit more effort and jobs. Yeah, if you give yourself more jobs, it's harder to be distracted to other things. And as you go more subtle into the tantras, you need less of those external supports. You still can use them, they can still be helpful. But in the beginning, it's actually a very useful tool to like learn how to do these mudras. They're also beautiful visualizations related to the inner channels. So it's, uh, it's something that is, is worth kind of getting used to if you're into it. Um, there can be a lot of power in that. And when you see the, the lamas use mudras and implements, you can really tell there's a lot more going on than just some gestures. There's a lot of energetic movement that's happening there. So just logistically, buy the ones that fit your hands nicely. Yeah. Test them and make sure the sound of it will make you happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it would be nice if, it, if they could be given to you by the Lama at the empowerment and that no one ever saw them before or afterwards, but it's not really how it is these days. So just go to the shop and find the ones you like. <laughs> um, but also what you can do is ask one of your teachers to bless them if you like, and that can actually add a lot, um, especially just your heart connection with them. Um, a lot of people have their private set that they keep covered and um, at home. And then they have their public set that they take to pujas. Um, so your choice, um, often Dharma centers will have a house that you can borrow though anyway, if you want to use them at public pujas. Yes, you were talking about empowerments and I, I think Agnes and, and, and another lady mentioned that they, um, they attended the online um, Chen Rezig empowerment by His Holiness a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I was I wasn't there obviously I was watching it online and I I was aware um that his holiness said that this is this is okay as it can be seen online as an empowerment for the Tibetan people here and also people in China and at, at the time I was thinking oh um does that 
does that mean I have had the empowerment by sitting here watching it online? <laughs> um, was that was that His Holiness giving me the thumbs up <laughs> that I'd had it or not? <laughs> um, because <clears throat> as I mentioned I've been attempting to do the inseparability mm. on a fairly regular basis, and I've I've always sort of in, in my head I've always taken the Chen Resig as being in me, not me being Chen Resig, but the Chen Resig being in, in me um, as an image. Mm. So does this mean that I've been given the green light to actually <laughs> be Chen Resig, <laughs> which I kind of feel I really want to be. I mean, well, Galagato, you know, is, <laughs> Galagato's highest yoga tantra. So it, it's one of these things where, um, if His Holiness said that by doing this online, you can receive it online, he means what he says. From your side, though, you have to have thought, I accept, <laughs> right? So you can't be like involuntarily empowered, right? <laughs> like if the cat walks by, the cat didn't get the empowerment. He probably got a blessing, but you know, you can't involuntarily be given a, an empowerment. So you can't be like a passive recipient. You had to be tracking what he was saying mm -hmm. and agreeing with what he was saying yeah. but if that was the case yeah. you have the empowerment great <laughs> <laughs> right. on, on, can I just say on that point um next weekend his holiness is is doing a higher yoga tantra um completion stage and his initiation and when I saw it I thought oh crumbs should should <laughs> Should I even think about getting involved with that? Is it possible to just watch it? And, and you know, I see you have to do a, a, a kind of a practice, a commit yeah. to a practice, and it's now been, and you can read what that practice is, which seems kind of familiar, but there seems, there's a bit longer and more complicated with things I don't really understand. And I think, well, should I be getting into this? <laughs> Well, you well, know, it's a good thing just to dip your toe into it. I'd... Look, it's it's one of these things where you want to be clear about your intention before you start. Because because yeah. so many of us have kind of stumbled into empowerments and not really known if we had it or not. And then we have ambivalence about the commitment because we had ambivalence about whether we were actually there. And it creates a lot of angst. Mm. Right. So what you so his holiness in his amazing compassion offers these things publicly and live like the Kala Chakra is highest yoga tantra. He'll offer it to thousands of people totally live as a blessing. You as the individual have to decide beforehand, am I there respectfully receiving it as a blessing or am I taking it as a practice? And if I'm taking it as a practice, that means I promise to do this practice every single day for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you have Gawagatso empowerment, that means you're already doing six session guru yoga every day for the rest of your life. You know, and there's ways you can purify if you, you know, get really sick or you traveled and you don't know the time zone or, you know, if, if stuff happens, there's ways you can purify. But you want to have the intention of keeping it perfectly for the rest of your life, remembering that in Buddhism to keep perfectly means addressing missteps purifying them and restoring them. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It means that your intention is to come back to it forever. So um, you don't want commitments to ever feel like a bag of rocks that you're carrying around like a burden. And that if you don't have um, commentary to the practice, it'll just feel like this weird, bizarre thing you have to do now and never will make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> and death is coming and his holiness is old and you don't want to miss yeah. opportunities, right? So these are all just <laughs> things to weigh up in your mind. Um, mm. But the point I'm trying to make is be very clear about what your intention is beforehand. Am I taking it as a blessing or am I taking it as a real empowerment? Mm. And be really clear with yourself. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and look, I mean, I, I say, full speed ahead with his holiness, but you really have to know yourself if you already have a ton of practices that you're keeping in perfectly and you're gonna feel all sorts of guilt about keeping yet one more thing in perfectly, that's something to think about. But if it's the thing that will elevate your practice and inspire you to go more deeply, you know, excellent. So just kind of sit with it and what your practice looks like. And it can just be so disheartening for students who have, um, 
been trying to practice Tantra for years, knowing that it's not perfect, letting it go, coming back to it, letting it go, coming back to it. And it, you have all of this angst that happens and the Buddhas will love you forever. You're not going to like lose the Buddhas <laughs> by being a crap practitioner, <laughs> but you start to feel a little sad and distant from your practice when you break promises, you know, because it makes means promises have less power. And making a promise is a powerful thing in all contexts, you know, so you're not going to be punished by anyone except your own mind, but your own mind probably will punish you a bit if you let go of commitments that you take. So it's just something to sit with and, and know that you can purify things, but, you know, use yeah, your best judgment, <laughs> use your best judgment, <laughs> yeah. sharpen the horns of the dilemma. <laughs> so um so we'll have a little break for lunch and um and then we'll have another session and um another um little bit of practice if you like as well yep excellent okay mm -hmm.